Hi, we have a lot of things that we want to share with you, and today's message is just one of them. I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here. Join us here every Sunday morning at 930 for our Bible study. We have different speakers that come, and I think you'll enjoy them. Matter of fact, today's message is also one of those. I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 1030 right here at Crossroads, which meets at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street in Howell, right here in Uptown Dallas. So if you have this Sunday off, come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. Okay. Uh, a dream is an expectation, isn't it? Yes. It's something that we, that we would like to have happen, yes. isn't it? A dream? A vision, something that I want, it's something that I want to have happen? Absolutely. We're still talking about that, but we're going to put it in a different perspective. We're going to take a look at the life of Paul and the things that he expected to do. His dream today, only we're going to call it something else. Uh, here in verse 9, those things, Paul is saying, and I'm reading out of KJV this morning, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Well, what did they learn? Paul was talking about the practices of being a good Christian believer. He was talking about being a good servant to God, the practices. So he's talking about the things that were learned. We're talking about where he talks about received, receiving the blessings. How many of you want to receive the blessings? Well, You've seen other people, and if you get jealous that they have, you need to start asking for them and seeing them in your own life. Things that you've learned, that you've seen, heard. He preached the gospel to these folks. He never stopped. You know, we use the word epistle, and Keith just passed, what, what did you pass? What course was it, Old Testament or New Testament? Both. He just passed both Old Testament and New Testament with what, the highest grades? And I would expect that. He's been a student of mine all these years. No. He's been taking two courses. He's gone back to school, and I'm really proud of him. But uh, he, he did good on both those, aced both of those types, or made the highest grades. I think what did you say? 98.4. I'm so sorry. What's wrong with the rest of that? Okay. But what happens is both what you have learned, received, heard the doctrines of the church and heard and seen the miracles. Paul was all about these four things. All about this. His whole life was wrapped up into these four things. So as we kind of take a look at that today, uh, I want you to remind yourself of the things that Paul's life was all about. How many of you have ever heard of a bucket list? What is a bucket list? Who can give me a definition? Things you want to do before you what? Kick the, bucket. kick the bucket. How many of you are going to kick the bucket? Can I see your hands? Unless Jesus comes back, what? We all will take the deep six, most of us. So that bucket list is a dream of things that we want to do before we die. Isn't that pretty much? It's a dream of things. Because most of the time, they're pretty outlandish, aren't they? Matter of fact, BMW, which I thought was interesting, uh, two years ago, three years ago coming up, it's uh, 2010, they asked a thousand people what their number one thing on their bucket list was. And they were looking for ad materials, what they were, they were driving at, and when they actually got it. People said that they wanted to do something daring and really life-changing. They wanted to really do something that was really way out there. Well, former Bush, Bush 41, did that. He jumped out of a plane, tandem, did skydiving on his 70th birthday, and then he did it again on his 80th birthday and 75. He did it three times. Jumped out of a plane. Now, I'm in planes too much to want to jump. <laughs> it's a long way down there. And to give your trust into a parachute or another parachute and the guy that's pulling the cord if you're going tandem like that, that's an awful lot. And for an older gentleman like that to do that and to be prepared and not to break anything on the way down, that's really a dream, isn't it? For most people. So a bucket list is about a container of dreams that we want to do. How many of you ever saw the movie Bucket List? Yes, Jacoby. Thank you, Stephen. How many of you saw the movie Bucket List? Jack Nicholson and... Uh, Morgan Freeman. How many of you saw it? Okay. 
What was it about? Two guys dying with terminal cancer. They found each other and they had their bucket list and they were going about going and doing all of those things. August 17th, 2008, David Freeman, co-author of the book, A Hundred Things to Do Before You Die, who was the instigator of that movie, his life and his dream was given to that movie. At age 47, he fell in his house and died from an injury from that fall. 47 years old. He had a dream of doing a hundred things before he died. And the, the irony of all of that, when you talk to his family, when his family were interviewed, they, he had done about half of all the things he ever wanted to do. In his whole life, at age 47, he's still way far away from all of that. His co-author, and I forget the guy's co-author name, I've got it down here, some, and I, I, I didn't put it down, but his co-author made the statement uh, that inspired the book and the movie from that. Uh, some of the things that they put down, that this is one of the, a couple of things that David Freeman put down. Uh, let's see, on his list before he died, uh, he wanted to go to the Academy Awards. He wanted to run with the Bulls in Spain. I think that would be pretty daring. I don't know that I'd want to do that. And one of the things was taking a voodoo pilgrimage to Haiti. But at 47, he didn't do any of those. And I, I, what I want that to drive a point home to you is, is that you don't know when you're going to do that. Take that last breath. You don't know if you're going to have a fall today and hurt your head and collapse on the floor. You don't know when you get out of here and you get on 635 with all that construction that an 18-wheeler isn't going to come rolling over you. You don't have a clue. We are not promised, the Bible says, we are not promised tomorrow. All we have is today. And Paul lived his life like every day was his last. He went about doing those four things all the time because they were important to him. They were very important to him. So what I want you to do is now I want you to turn over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I thought what was interesting about the hundred things on the list None of them, not one of them, had anything to do about preparing for your last day and your next breath in heaven. Not one of them. Not one of them was about eternity. Not one of them was about meeting your maker, meeting Jesus hand in hand. None of it. All of that was about what I want to do here. None of it was about preparation for the hereafter. I thought, how disappointing. You think about everything that you want to do in life but you forget about the one thing is, you are never going to die. This body will, but what makes you you is going to go on forever. I'm planning for that. I'm thinking about that. Because that's a whole lot more than the 47 years that he got, or if we all get to be 120 or 140, it's still not going to be long enough. So I want you to be thinking what's in your bucket list. Because what we're going to do, we're going to pick up the life of Paul here in just a moment. We're going to pick it up in Acts 20. We're not turning there yet because we're in 2 Corinthians. But we're going to pick this, his life up at about 58 AD. And we're going to take a look at some of the things that he said that he wanted to do. But I want to temper that with the things that we know that he did while he was alive. So here in 2 Corinthians, I want us to start reading with verse, uh, chapter 11. Did I tell you that? Chapter 11. And I want us to start reading here on verse 23. Are they, and I'm, again, I'm reading from the KJV this morning. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labor, labors, I am more in works, and more in abundant, and in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in deaths often, and of the Jews five times, five times, he was whipped, save one, 39 stripes. A Jew could only be given that many stripes one time in their whole life. But Christians were open season. So five times this happened to him. 
thrice, three times, I was beaten with rods. I don't know if you know what that is, but they were put into shackles. Their feet were put into shackles, and the bottom of their feet were beaten with metal rods until the bones in the, in the feet were broken. They wanted to stop him from doing what he was doing. But you see, when you have a dream, when you have a vision, when there's something that you really want to do in life, nothing's going to keep you from doing that if you really are sincere about it. You know, if it's just something, well, I want to go to the Academy Awards, I can let that one go. <laughs> I can see it on TV a whole lot better than what I could probably get a seat at. I was stoned once. Three times he was suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. He was floating in the ocean, hoping to get somewhere. In journeyings, he did several travels. We, we know of three journeys that he made, but he could not have started as many churches as he started in his life, over 260 churches. He couldn't have started all of those unless he'd gone to, on more trips, but we only have count of three of them. In perils of robbers, beaten, perils of my own countrymen, those people around him, perils of the heathen, those people on the outside, perils in the city, in the perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and painness, painfulness, and in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. I mean, this is too strange for fiction. One man having had all of this happen to him. That's, that, you, can't, you can't think up that kind of stuff. Besides those things, all of that, are without and which cometh upon me daily the care of all of those churches. He was thinking about how can I take care of those while I'm in jail? How can I take care of and meet the needs of those churches while I'm over here traveling? How can I get a word to them? How can I encourage them? How can I speak something good over them? How can they hear about how much hope they should be having? He was wondering how he could accomplish all that God had for him to do. He had a bucket list that was longer than 100. But he broke them down so that we could understand them. So what I want us to do, you can turn over with me to Acts chapter 20. And uh, I'm going to be reading from the NIV here. I'll give you a little pref preface here. Uh, here in Acts chapter 20, it's towards the end of Paul's life. Paul is not slowing down. It's about 58 AD, as I said earlier. He can see the life track, his tracks of his life coming to a close, looming in front of him. The campaign against Christianity was at its highest point. Nero was trying to snuff it all out. They were burning Christians right and left all the way up to his castle. I mean, all the things that were going on, horrific. Within seven years of this time, Peter would be crucified head down for his faith. Paul will be arrested for the final time in Jerusalem, and his earthly voice will be silenced by an execution. Ex Executor's axe on his throat. But Paul is not slowing down. You see, it amazes me that people start thinking about retiring early now. I don't know how they can do that, Doug. Because <laughs> with the collapse of all the 401ks, few years ago, stocks, I mean, it was like starting over again. And for me, starting over was really starting like below ground, coming back up. But people start retiring. They start cashing in on, on the rest of their life. Uh, those of you that have ever been to my house and been to the, into the parties, the, the two people that, uh, uh, Manny and Anelda. Manny is actually five years younger than I am. His wife is probably within a couple of years of that. They together don't have any children. They have this big house. They've got a cute little poodle named Bentley. And uh, they walk Bentley around. And, and uh, I was talking to him the other day because I'd seen a lot of construction going on in their house. I mean, they, from what it looked like, the number of vehicles around the front, they had gutted the house because they were just putting it all back together again. I mean, it, and it's not that old. 
And I asked him, I said, what, what, what are y'all doing? He said, well, we're fixing up the house because we're retiring. I said, you're sinking all that money into that house? <laughs> you will never be able to sell that house. You will have that house forever. He said, I know. I know. And that's why we're doing all the things we want to do to it right now, because we've cashed in. He retired. She decided that she didn't want him staying home by herself, by himself, so she retired. She was an RN in charge of lots of health care centers here in the city. And they are just bored now when you talk to them. They're bored. He's thinking about going back to work. She's thinking about picking up some kind of uh, consulting on the side because now they're sitting at home looking at each other. <laughs> it gets old real quick. And so she said, you need to go back to work. Retirement isn't what it looks like. Paul had every reason in the book to retire. This guy was beat up, chewed up, spit out, all but hung, and we find out that he gets executed. I think it's amazing that people look at the life of Paul and say, oh, poor Paul, you know, he had that thing, you know, that he just prayed and prayed that God would take away, but God just said, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Poor Paul. You know what? There should be more people like Paul who would be able to accomplish as much as he did in his life and still start all those churches with his feet busted up. I know some people that can't get up because they got a little twinge in their back. It's amazing. But Paul here sees the goal. The goal is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is his bucket list, is to get that word out to as many people as possible. That was his goal. His dream was, how far can I get this thing while I'm still alive? And he does everything to try to accomplish that. So here in Acts chapter 20, it's, we're going to read a little bit, just to kind of give you what, a little bit what's going on. I think it's important. Uh, uh, I will tell you this, that uh, verses uh, 1 through about 6, we're not going to go through. It's a bunch of people that are traveling with him. There's seven guys. It lists all of their names and where they're from. We don't need to read that. But they finally get to, uh, uh, to Taurus, and they, they get there, and Paul is preaching in the house. And uh, it's on verse 7. We'll start here. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, I think this is interesting, he kept talking until midnight. He's planning on leaving tomorrow, so what is he going to do? He's going to make sure he fills you up until you can't take any more, and then he's going to put some more in. He's just preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. I can appreciate that. There are many lamps in the upstairs room where the people were meeting. Seated in, seated in a window was a young man named uh, Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. As you read it in the NIV, I thought that was really good. When he was sound asleep, I mean, probably snoring, somebody probably did this to wake him up, they bumped him and he fell out of a three-story window to his death. And they, when they went down to pick him up, he was dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed. He said he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, didn't stop at midnight. He was interrupted. He had to start all over again, which Paul usually does several times. If he, and he closes several times. He really doesn't know how to say, see ya. <laughs> he can't do that. He has to say goodbye to everyone. And then he, he, he leaves out a few people, so he starts saying goodbye again. I don't know, some of you have been to family reunions that are kind of like that. Went upstairs, broke bread. Then the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So everything is fine with him. We're going to get back to him in a moment. Let's start and go to verse 13. And they went ahead to the ship and sailed for Isis, where we were going to, the, where, uh, where we were going to take Paul abroad. He had made this arrangement because he was going to go there on foot. Now these people are traveling on the boat and he's going on foot. And when he met us at Asus, we took him aboard and went to uh, Militine. 
And the next day we set sail and there was arrived off of Chios. They're traveling, traveling. The day after we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived in Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible by the day of Pentecost. This guy is on the road. How many have ever traveled? How many have ever traveled? I mean, extensively, I have. And you know what? Traveling on air is hard, especially today with TSA. It's hard. There was no TSA. There were no planes, no buses, no cars. We're talking on foot and in little thimble-sized boats going across oceans and seas. I mean, we're not talking first class here. We're not talking good food. We're not talking the cares of a turndown service in your bed at night. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, verse 17, they said to him, You know I have lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. And in the midst of serving, of, of severe testing by the plots of the Jewish opponents, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. This guy has already been told, it's coming. You're going to have a bad time. Want to go on? Roll the dice. You don't know what you're going to get. But he did know that bad things were coming, and it didn't stop him. You see, I think when you have a dream, when you really want to do something, you're not limited by anything except your own mind. People aren't out there stopping you. They're going to try to dissuade you, but they're not physically stopping you from doing what you want to do. How many of you came out? Did you really want to do that? Did they help you out? No. You did it and you were out. And it was probably the most excruciating moment in your whole life. I know for me it was. But what I will tell you is, the dream on the other side of that very difficult moment is worth that. Yesterday, Abigail, my youngest daughter, who's pregnant, we found out a few weeks ago, yay, 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 is gonna have her first sonogram tomorrow. Happy for her, because she's gonna find out how the baby's doing and all that. She's really concerned because she's had some, had some uh, headaches, migraines, and I said, that's normal, you're on hormones until it, out the wazoo, taking them every day, making sure that the baby holds on. I said, that will be over, you're stopping that, the migraines will stop, you'll be fine. When, I can guarantee you, she really doesn't have a clue what she's in for. <laughs> Has no clue. She may have an idea because She's been around her sisters who have given birth, but she's never done that. Now, I was there when all four of my kids were born, and I'm so glad that I did not come equipped to do that. I am very glad, because I don't know that I'd want to do that. As someone said, for guys, it's thinking about taking your lower lip and pulling it all the way around to the back of your head. That's what that would probably feel like. So when you think about that. But you know what? She is looking forward to it. Because there's something on the other side of that. The joy of what they've wanted all of this time and gone through and all the, the stupid tests and the shots and the surgeries to have this baby. I mean. The pain has already been there, been there, been there. She was warned, 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 and they still wanted to do it. And it's still coming. The big day. Cheryl remembers the big day. No? Okay. So what happened? No? Oh, I thought that was yours. Thank God for that other mother. <laughs> We're praying for her still. Does she know what she's missing? Jacoby. 
you have to realize that there will be some challenges along the way to your dream. There's going to be challenges. Everything that you want to do in life, there will be met with challenge. Keith, you know you're going to graduate. You know you're going to get that new degree. You know you're going to do that. But there's a lot of hard work between now and then because your semesters are really tight and short. And there's a lot of work and learning that has to be done in a very short amount of time. And you have to give up a lot of stuff in order to do that. You have to give up a lot of other things and put your attention on the things that are really important. Because if you don't, you will get at 47 and not have half of the things that you want to do in your life really accomplished. And I'm far past that, that 47. I want to make sure that every day of my life, it counts. So let's read on. Verse 22. Now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. We read that. Uh, 24. Very important. If you've got a, a regular Bible, circle it. If not, remember or write this scripture down. Very important because we're going to come back to it. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, everybody say only aim. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's all he ever wanted. That was his dream. The bucket list comes along the way to help meet all of the needs that you have all the way to reaching that goal. Verse 25, now I know none of you, now I know that none of you among who I am gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. He's telling them, these folks, you will never see me again. He already knows he's going to die when he gets to Jerusalem. It's already, it's already there. He knows he's going to his own death, but he knows he's got to go to preach. He knows he's got to complete the race. He knows that he's got to go and give up his life. He knows he's got to be a testimony. He knows that his life, that will be the stamp of everything that he's ever done. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. He says, I have told you all. If you didn't get it this round, I don't know what's wrong with you because I've preached it until some of you fell out the window. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Therefore, 27, for I have not... Uh, hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought you, he bought you with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will rise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. He was crying about it. You don't understand. This is what's going to happen. He's telling them. And I don't think that this is, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. God already showed him that that's the life of mankind. That's the life of man. But Paul is not dissuaded by that he says you know what if you become one of those that's your lot but i have done my job i have preached the gospel and i have told you time and time and time and time and time again i'm sure they could have just you know like brother hagan how many of you remember brother hagan i used to have some of his old reel to reel tapes remember the old reel to reel tapes i could play that by the new cassette tapes <laughs> or the DVDs now of his old, of his last services, and they were almost exactly alike because he preached the same thing over and over again. Because it was truth. It was truth. And truth doesn't change. You were talking about the word this morning. You were talking about a meditate was to mutter. I'm going like, where have you been, Kidder? I heard that back in the 70s. It doesn't change. Just because the age changes doesn't change this, because this never changes. Never changes. Now I commit to you, the, to God, 
to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. He's taking care of everybody. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with them all and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. He's on his way. This is the last that they would ever see him. This is a man who has a dream. And it's, been, it's about pleasing God and doing the things along the way that God wants him to do. So if you've got something to take notes, I'm going to give you a few things that are in his bucket list. Because it might be wise for all of us to pick up a few tips from somebody who had a whole lot more going on than what we may think. I'm going to use some words. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Five things that I'm going to talk about that are in his bucket list out of what we just talked about, what we just read. First off, he was all about encouraging people. It was all about encouraging people. And the one thing I can tell you is our community needs to be encouraged. They are beat down on every side. On every side. I saw a little, uh, oh, if you, 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 you can YouTube short uh, gay and lesbian films. And they'll, all, they'll bubble up. There's dozens of them. But I saw one about Two guys that grew up together, they both dated, they both realized that they liked each other, that they fell in love. One of the guy's parents found out and said, you can't see the other guy anymore. That night, he drove to the other guy's house. They went out. They were always swimming together. One saved the other guy's life when he was younger. They both enjoyed swimming. They both took a set of handcuffs and handcuffed themselves together to the bottom of the rail of the staircase in the, in the pool. And that was the end. It really was the end, wasn't it? But that kind of life doesn't go on film because it's not real over and over and over again. Our community needs to be encouraged that, you know what, there are other ways out. And it's just like the thing that the city did, encouraging young kids that you don't need to do things that are radical. Death is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Amen. It will go away. What seems bad today in the light of tomorrow will be better. It always looks better. We think the world is coming to an end, but tomorrow it will look different. So we need to encourage people. In Acts chapter 20, you know, first off, it takes courage to do what we're doing. It takes courage to live a Christian life today. And we all need to be encouraged. You need to encourage each other. And that can't just always come from me. It's got to come from you to each other. Acts chapter 20, we talked about Eutychus falling out of the window. <laughs> Three stories. There are times when some people need to be given a boot in order to avoid falling asleep on the job as others of Jesus have done. I'm going to tell you something. In love, there is no reason this building should not be full. Not a reason. Not an, there is not a reason. There are enough gay Christians in this community that do not go to church. Amen. That do not go to church, Tim. You're right. That could be encouraged at your invitation to come. But see, we are falling down on our job. We're not doing the work. Oh, we're having a good time. And we fellowship one with another. And that's great. And I think that's all important. And I applaud you for that. Because that really is a good thing. That builds each other up. But we got to take that strength in and we got to apply it elsewhere. We've got to do something with that. You just can't pray that the community comes to God. You have to do something about it. Amen. Faith without works is what? Dead. 
just like that guy falling out of the window. You have to have a passion about it. Paul lived with a passion on this. So he encouraged those around him. He prayed for those around him. I want to read you a prayer. And this is a prayer that Tim and Kidder pray every day because I've heard it from them. And it's a prayer from Ephesians. And this is Paul's prayer for those around you and what you need to be praying around all of those people as well. Ephesians 4, 14 through 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. What is that reason? From whom every family in heaven and on earth deserves its name, derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, which we just talked about, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Jesus Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to immeasurably, everybody say immeasurably, more than we ask or imagine or think according to his power that works within us to him be the glory in the church in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. You cannot think big enough to think bigger than God. Amen. You can't. Your finite mind, those people that say that God can't love any particular group of people, they are thinking with a finite mind. They do not have it. We pray that we have the mind of Christ. We pray that we'll open it up and that we can gather tidbits and little gold nuggets and put them in there. Hopefully one day we'll be able to have them. But we can't think that big, so we have to think immeasurably. You can't think that big. So he prayed for everyone. You know, I prayed for my kids. I think every parent prayed for their kids when they were growing up. Didn't you, Andy, with your kids? I prayed for my four daughters that they would graduate from high school. They all did. Graduate from college. All that wanted to went and completed. Now some of them are going back and finishing, doing something different. That they would find guys that they would love and that would love them and take care of them and treat them like they taught me to treat them. That went over your heads. Okay. <laughs> And three of them have done that. One, she's not looking, and that's okay with me. I wanted to see them all have children that wanted to, and soon I will. I pray that they would know, most of all, God, not like I know him, not like their mother knows him, not like the grandparents knew him before they passed away. I pray that God would reveal himself to them in a special way that only they would understand him. Amen. I don't want them to know the God that I know because I could be limiting them. I could be shortchanging their faith by saying, I want you to go to church with me and I want you to understand God just like me because then you'll have all the limitations that I have just like me. I don't want that. I want them to have an opportunity to know God in a bigger way than I know him. So I don't make them go to a church, but they all go. Because I prayed that in there. But you can't just pray for people, folks. You have to do something. Oh, I pray for my neighbor to go to church with me. Did you ever stop to ask them? <laughs> Did you ever decide to say, you know what? Let me take you out to lunch after church. Can I do something for you? Your car's not running. Let me, let me take you and run that errand, and then you come go to church with me next Sunday. Do something. Make a tangible, physical, verbal invitation to them. Don't just pray. Faith without works is dead, folks. It's not going to happen unless you do something. This community is not going to be reached until you decide to get out on the streets and do something. It's not going to happen. You can pray all you want to. And God wants to move 
but he has to move through you. So he encouraged people. He prayed for people. He equipped them. You know, one of the greatest struggles in our lifetime is not financial. It's not political. It's not social. It is spiritual. If we had a better understanding who God was, there would be no need for social services because we would be doing what we should be doing. If the church did what Paul subscribed that we do in Acts, share and do all the things that we're supposed to be doing, there would be no need for social security. There wouldn't be needs of people living on the streets, under bridges. There wouldn't be that. But the problem is, we're not spiritual enough to grasp the concept that if we give, we're going to get back in return. So you have to decide, you know what, I'm going to do something. I'm going to help people learn that they don't have to be poor anymore. There is no place in the Bible that you can pull a scripture out that Jesus said, it's great to be poor. Amen. Because he wasn't. He was the son of the living God. There was never a need in his life. Never. All he did was looked up to heaven and the need was there. All those people around him, they all had needs. What did he do? I want you to go fish. The first fish you catch, open its mouth. There will be enough money in there to pay not your taxes, but all of our taxes. He knew that it was there. It was tangibly there. But he had the spiritual connection to understand that. We're still trying to get that God is bigger than we are, much less to get his divine direction. So he equipped them. Equipping those around him for spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. Nothing more. Knowing and using the Bible. You know, I think it's interesting that people talk about the Old Testament as if it's gone. And, you know, it has, has been added to it a New Testament. A New Testament. Because when the New Testament was written, all they had was the Old. And Paul makes a statement that all Scripture is given for inspiration and doctrine. All scripture is given. So we should learn something from everything. We also have to take that into consideration that Jesus Christ came, fulfilled all of this, and gave us a new understanding about who he is. But the Bible still has some good strengths to it. So that's why we don't divorce ourselves from what the Bible says. So you've got to teach people, because I put it out in a, in a, in a uh, Facebook thing this week. You shall know the... And the truth shall set you free. You know, faith comes by. All of those things, you have got to teach other people. Because you know what? They're not going to learn it on their own. They may not have a Bible. They may not have a Bible app. You can get them that. They're free. Those Bibles now are free. There's no excuse for nobody to not have a Bible anymore. Knowing the Bible, he knew it. But you know what? You shall, I heard it misquoted by somebody in a movie yesterday. You know, the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. The truth you know will set you free. But unless you get into this, you're not going to know this. and You're not going to understand it. And so you have to get into the Word of God and you have to encourage other people to do the same thing. Because without it, you're, they're all sunk. Preserving his witness was another one. Without a computer, without an iPhone, without a word processing unit, Paul wrote about his witness for Christ and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Mostly while he was in prison. <laughs> Lots to do when you got time on your hands. He made use of every moment of his life. Nothing was going to waste. He was always about doing that list of things that set his dream apart from a lot of other people. 
He did it so that even after he was gone, his witness would continue. And it still does. So in closing, I've got some remarks that I wrote down. I want to just read them to you. What are you focusing on as you finish your race? As I said earlier, we're all running out of track. This train is going to ditch soon. But what are we focusing on between now and then? Some of us are going to have shorter length tracks than others. Hopefully not. But you know what? Dr. Brent died last year at what, 43, 42, 43? That's a short track. You don't know what that next moment is. That's the reason why you got to make every moment count. In the life, he said, those things which you've learned and seen and heard in me, do those things. Do those things. One day, all of our clocks are going to stop. <laughs> Nobody gets a free pass. We're all going to die. What do you want to complete before your journey is done here? Culture says, our culture says, put more things in that bucket. Do more stuff before you die. Go to Paris, go to Rome, go to Moscow, go to St. Petersburg. Go, 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 go. See it all. See the world. Experience it all. Don't leave anything untouched. But the Bible tells us our life is about what gets poured out of our life, not what put into it. You have something within you that those around you need. If Paul's list, what I talked about today, became our list, if we renewed our commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ today, maybe no one <laughs> would ever see our desires and make a movie out of it, you know? Maybe not like a bucket list. Nobody might make a movie like that. But you know what? We could all know that we've been a part of the greatest story ever told. I want you to think about those things which you have on that list of things you want to do, places you want to go. And I want you to start infusing the gospel back in there. Start putting the gospel back in there and see what doesn't begin to take place. You're going to see good things come when you do the right things first. Father God, right now in Jesus' name, Father, we're thankful for our elder brother Paul who was so eloquent to tell us so many times and in so many ways that our life is about being an expression of the love of Jesus Christ. That our lives, like his, the epistles, the letters of Paul, it should be an open book that when people see us, they see the life of Christ in us, operating in love towards everyone. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise today. And Father, I just ask that your spirit, the Holy Spirit, begin to move on every person that hears this word today. That you'll renew your commitment to Jesus Christ today. And that you will be about your Father's business in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Amen. Amen. How many of you can be with us or would like to try doing something different on a Saturday night? How many of you would like to try to do that with us on this Saturday night? Meet us at Hunkies at what time? Seven o'clock. Where? Hunkies. What night? Saturday night. When? Seven o'clock. We will see you seven o'clock this Saturday night, 26th of January. God bless you. Have a good week. Hi, and thank you for watching today's service. As I spoke to you at the beginning, we have a couple of outreaches which I think are important for you to know that we're participating in, and you might want to join us. We've got one, which is our orphanage in Uganda. It's 320 children, about, that have been left there because their parents have either died or are affected by HIV AIDS. There are no relatives that will take them in because it's such a stigma to have HIV or even to be gay there in Uganda. We also have a church in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. It's just a starting work. 
but there is a lot that we can do to help them. And if you'd like to join and be a part of that, we invite you to go to our webpage, www.crossroadscommunitychurch.us, and you'll see a tab there that says donation. You can make your donation through PayPal. It's secure, and we'll get that, and we'll send it on to them. So if you'd like to participate, we thank you for doing it in advance because we know that God is going to bless you. Thank you for watching today, and tune in next week.